I would like to take, take an opportunity to thank everybody for coming to this wonderful event. And I am going to go ahead and introduce our lovely panelists. So I'm gonna start with the panel chair, Dr. Brian Johnson. Um, Brian Johnson is a professor of psychiatry and anesthesia at Upstate Medical University. He came to Upstate after a, almost three decades at Harvard Medical School. He's been chair of the discussion group on addiction of the American Psychoanalytic Association and is a member of um, the Committee on Governmental Relations and Insurance. And uh, also the Medical Society of the State of New York Addiction and Psychiatry Medicine Committee and the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, the Controversial Issues Committee. He has published a book, 35 papers, and four book chapters. Um, next, I have Ms. Helen Hudson, who is a Syracuse Common Council at or Counselor at Large, serving as a chairperson of the Public Works Committee and member of the Public Safety, Education, and Human Development and Neighborhood Preservation Committees. Ms. Hudson is a co-founder of Mothers Against Gun Violence and a co-founder of the Trauma Response, as well as a co-chair of the HOPE Initiative for the Sy City of Syracuse. She serves on the board of directors of Volunteer Lawyer Project, um, Onondaga Historical Association, and Women Transcending Boundaries. And last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Indu Gupta, who is the Commissioner of Health at the Onondaga County Health Department in Syracuse. She completed her medical degree in India, her Master of Arts in Public Administration from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, and a Master of Public Health from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Dr. Gupta, or excuse me, Gupta is a voluntary faculty member at Upstate Medical University, is teaching public health and also medical students. She's a board member of the New York State County Health Officials and the Health E-Connections, a regional health information organization of Central New York. And um, Dr. Gupta, excuse me, Gupta is a co-chair of Onondaga Drug Task Force and Health Committee of Greater Syracuse Hope, which is a local anti-poverty coalition. So now I'd like to turn the spotlight to our first speaker, Ms. Helen Hudson. Thank you, and I'm probably the only one here that is not in the medical profession, but I'm going to come to you as a mother of an adult addict. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges that my son faced. And I applaud Upstate University for all of the work they're doing and the state of New York, but we still have more work to do. Huh, being a mother of an ad addicted child it's a little tough because as, as an adult addict, your hands are tied. I sit back and I watch my child as he spiraled out of control. I watch my child as he set himself up to either be murdered or murder someone. But when I tried to intercept with this, I was told he's an adult. Doesn't matter, he's still my child. So I think that we need to start looking at things in a different way. Let me go back a little bit further. Before I knew that I had a drug addict, he was an addict at the age of 14. But when the Lieutenant Governor talked about how well criminals can, you know, change and cam camouflage themselves, he did that quite well. I didn't realize until he was probably 28, 29 years old that he was addicted. And at that point of his addiction, it was really out of my hands. It wasn't at the point of where I could take him and say, we're gonna put you in treatment. It was at the point of where when I would talk to folks, tried all of the normal you know, lines of getting my child treated. I took him to one facility and he received a day pass the same day. So he was back out on the streets, talking to the drug dealers, getting what he needed to get to continue his addiction. I watched my child spiral out of control, and three times I received phone calls. The first call was he was shot. That was from putting himself in harm's way from his addiction. 
The second two times he was stabbed, and each time I was spared because God blessed me with keeping him alive. But I know other mothers that were not so, they weren't so blessed. I have a mother that I know her daughter went into a treatment facility. She was released and within 24 hours she was dead. And her parents could not actually step in because again, she was an adult addict. So this adult addict, through her death, left three children behind that will never know their mother. And she was only 28 years old. So I'm here today to talk about, you know, dealing with adult addicts because there has to be some type of a way that we can think about it as a parent, as someone that really cares about this adult person that has this sickness. You can't tie my hands. You can't tell me that I can't get my child the help he needs because he's an adult. Because that adult, he goes out and he kills someone, I have to wear that. Or he's murdered, I have to bury him. And all of this comes about because he's out on the streets looking for that self-medication to make himself feel good again. So I'm just going to implore that we try to look at ways to give the families the help they need. Because our children, regardless of if they're 12 or if they're 35, they're still our children. And my son is 36 years old and had a conversation with Dr. Um, Johnson a few minutes ago, and he asked me, thank God he was my lifesaver. He was my bridge to this. Because we need to treat the whole person. We need to treat the mental illness, which comes from the drug addiction, which is huge, and we need to treat the drug addiction. And as um, Lieutenant Governor said, we'll have, we don't have enough room in the morgue. We don't have enough room in mental health either. Because you walk around, and I, I ride the streets a lot, and I know a lot of these families that's dealing with this. And when you look at these children, and it kind of breaks my heart because you know they're addicted, and they're walking the streets, and you see the things that they're doing that could cause themselves harm or other folks harm, and there's no way to move them. They go through the court systems. And I sat in court one day, and I heard the judge tell this young man, which I know, and I know he's addicted to heroin. And the drug says, well, if you come back before me, I'm going to put you in prison. Do you think he cares? That's the furthest thing from his mind. And once they go into the prison system, they do not receive the help they need. My son took a trip to get high down to New York City. And in being high, him and everybody in the car, they were pulled over in New Jersey. Well, he actually did two and a half years in New Jersey. And they were trying to give him 25 years for traveling along for the get high. He was being charged with the drug. So again, we have to have something in place to be able to help our adult children overcome their addictions. Just because the age goes past 18, it doesn't mean they're not my child. So I'm just going to implore that we understand about the HIPAA law, but I don't want to bury mine, and I know a lot of mothers didn't want to bury theirs. So I thank you very much for your time. please. I don't know who's in charge of tech, but this one has slides. So I'm Brian Johnson. The first slide is going to show you that opioid maintenance, which is either methadone or buprenorphine, is the gold standard of treatment. And I'm showing you some studies that have come out this year and last. Uh, a longitudinal four and a half year study about what happens when patients are on opioid maintenance. Here it is. Uh, terrific study, and so the annual mortality is about 1%. You can see that you can see it either way. Some people would say we're preventing a lot of opioid use, others might say. We're giving people opioids that they're taking along with street opioids. They certainly use lots of other drugs. Uh, you can see after four and a half years on maintenance, two-thirds of the patients are still injecting drugs. 
and you can see that about half of them drop out. Next. All right, so at Upstate, we're working on some innovative things, and I have to think, everyone here is my friend, but especially Montosh Dewan, who has backed our having a completely innovative service here. This is a diffusion tensor imaging uh, picture of the seeking system, which is in green, and it's the system in the body that makes you want to go get food, water, and uh, sex and relationships, and it's what's taken over by drugs. It can't be an addictive drug unless it can command this center in a way that I'm going to show you in a minute. Next slide. So what we do in our society is we uh, market drugs to children, and I use old pictures so I don't get sued by current drug manufacturers, <laughs> but it's always the same. The goal is to entice children into taking in a drug that will change their brain. So for cigarettes, uh, in the 20th century, 100 million people were killed, and in the 21st century, we're on track to have a billion deaths in the world from tobacco. Next. Uh, what happens, you're an adolescent, and this is a beautiful uh, paper about the gateway hypothesis. Number one, children are doing illegal things, so they learn to uh, buy cigarettes when it's illegal for them to do it or obtain alcohol, but they're also changing their brains with these uh, gateway drugs, and other drugs are more easily added. So you can see the difference between uh, children in Indiana high schools who use the gateway drugs, 19% of them are also using prescription drugs like opioids, and almost no one who doesn't do this, there's this startling 49% of uh, boys who go to the gym and use steroids get addicted to heroin, and this is a different study that shows if you start using cigarettes before the age of 18, I'm sorry, 15, you are 80 times more likely to use illicit drugs. Next. So this is again from my service. The uh, triangle at the lower right-hand corner is the upper drug uh, uh, things. It's uh, nicotine, amphetamines, and cocaine. And at this level, I'll just say nicotine and cocaine are natural insecticides that kill the brains of insects that would eat their leaves. Human use is slightly different, but it blocks the monoamine reuptake transporter protein and turns on barrages of dopamine, which makes the drug salient and desired. The downer pathway is represented at the left by opioids. There's a break on the VTA that's GABAergic, and it's turned off by downer drugs. So upper drugs, cigarettes and cocaine are obviously more addicting than opioids are, but it's still, the number is 26% of people who obtain a prescription from a doctor for opioids go on to opioid use disorder next. All right, and we make the drug available. The inflection point that you can't see is 1996, so this is part of the epidemic. Next. Uh, opioids are about the worst thing you can give for chronic pain, so this is called opponent process theory. Every oxycodone you take helps with your pain, and over time, this B process is making things hurt more and more. It's called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. We have some papers coming out that suggest that it is the rule, not the exception. Almost everyone becomes hyperalgesic if they stay on opioids. Everything hurts, and then they just turn up the dose. Next. Uh, we've piloted this uh, use of a pure blocker, naltrexone, used in very tiny doses to reverse this process. The cold presser test is a fancy name for a dumb old beer cooler full of ice water. You see how long you can keep your arm in it. Average for our control group is now 113 seconds. So when we put our hyperalgesic patients on naltrexone, you can see the baseline time is 16 seconds. The ice water hurts terribly, 
even if they're on huge doses of opioids, and about a month later, their pain tolerance is dramatically improved. Next. This is a complex slide, but you guys function where it says healthy functioning. Opioids regulate human uh, interactions. So at the right side, it's like you get home after a hard day at work and you're with your three children and at five o'clock you're excited to see them and at 11 o'clock is would you god damn it go to bed. <laughs> it, it actually hurts to have too much opioid tone at the left side is you need a, you wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and you need to see those kids again we use the opioid system unconsciously to regulate human interactions. At the left side is fibromyalgia, which is a, another disease we've learned to treat, and post-detox. People post-detox are hurting from not enough opioid tone, which is where the naltrexone comes in. Next. This is a graph, maybe you can't see it, but it's a comparison of pain patients and addicted patients. The blue lines in the center up at 100%, the pain patients have 100% pain, but the addicted patients, it's about 50%. The red bars are the addicted patients, and you can see the difference between people who just can't get off their opioids because it's terrifying and they vomit and they hurt and they need our help to get off them versus the addicted patients where the three disorders on the left are depression, ADHD, and borderline personality. If you're gonna treat these patients effectively, you need a psychotherapy approach, which is much more powerful than pills in most cases. On the right side are all the comorbid disorders. So nicotine addiction, cannabis, cocaine are very common in the addicted population. And you see that's not true of the pain patients. And finally, it's not on this slide, but it was part of this uh, outcome study. About a third of the patients with uh, opioid addiction or drug addiction have drug dreams. The, the uh, seeking center is taken over and you begin to look for the drugs even while you're asleep. In the pain patients, it was zero. Next. Okay, so we're trying to do outcome studies on our service and uh, we do 100% outpatient detox, so you can see I put in three NIDA-sponsored studies, and they do the, you see counselor, and you get some medicine, and uh, our outcomes for detox are 92%. So this combination of seeing the patients every day for psychotherapy and diagnosing the comorbid disorders immediately uh, and uh, the way we do detox, which I stole from some brilliant Israelis who first published it in the 90s. Uh, it's very effective, 60%, one month off opioids. I'm sorry it's that low, but it's still better than just about everyone. And finally, our treatment is short. So if you need long-term treatment, we stabilize you and send you on, or you go to Narcotics Anonymous but the average number of visits is 13, which means we can take a huge number of patients in. So for example, Krauss Chemical Dependency has 130 staff. We have two paid staff, and we see about half as many opioid addicted intakes as they do. Next. Okay, but this is obviously an, an inadequate response to the opioid crisis, so what I hope will eventually happen is we'll open something that I am calling the Intervention Center. We could extend this model if we had a few more staff so that it could be open 24 hours a day, as Ms. Hudson and Lieutenant Governor Hochul said, you need to be there when the patient is ready for treatment. So famously, we can't treat people who need treatment, only people who want treatment. We want to make it open all the time. You come in, we stabilize you, we have a, a way to treat a large number of patients already, but if people want all these other services like opioid maintenance, 
we can refer them over there. We would take intakes from all the local hospital emergency departments. So this is my dream of what we could do here in Syracuse. Thanks very much. Uh, it is a good segue as my role in public health department, we look at population data, we look at the information which comes from each and every individual like Councillor Hudson's son and the way the treatment Dr. Johnson is providing. But we are all struggling how to find the balance and that's where the question comes at what is the role of society and how can we work together to address not only opioid but so many other problems which we encounter unique to our own individual communities. So like in public health, we say, can you hear me? I think I'm pretty loud, most of it, right? Um, and I have a habit of moving around, so just bear with me. If you can't hear, just say, go back. Um, so the question first is, how big is the problem? And it is a big problem. It is international problem. It's a global problem. Uh, 26 to 36 million people in, uh, in, uh, throughout the world are being affected, whether it's a heroin, whether it's a prescription opioid, or whether something else. It is a serious global health problem, which is affecting physical, social, and emotional well-being of everybody and having a lot of economic cost to the society. United States, we are very unique, you know that. We are less than 5% of world's population. And guess what? We use more than 99% of world's hydrocodone supply. Do we have all the pain of the world, right? That's what you think of. So that is something we have to, as a society, we started to think, what is there, what we can do, what role we can play. So current epidemic, as Lieutenant uh, Hochul has mentioned, and it has been pretty much said many times, and you are aware, is that increasing use of opiate prescription resulting in addiction first to the prescription medication when it's not available, or doctor said, no, you don't need that. Of course, people go to the cheaper and readily available, and which can give them higher, like a more high, is heroin comes into the picture. And these two things have contributed to the problem which we are seeing right now. So solution has to be kind of focused in that direction. Why do we say this is an epidemic? Because there are many things which we have to pinpoint, not on that how, when we are looking into health consequences, we are looking into education, employment, housing, crime, all these things are being affected by opioid epidemic at individual level, at family level, and community level. So you can put some dollar figures there, less prescription opioid epidemic is, uh, is causing economic burden on the society in excess of 70, $76 billion or so. But we don't know the how actually enormous uh, amount it is contributing to. So, but keep that in mind that when you are writing prescription as a provider, there are consequences to individual patient as well as to the society. And that's what we started to think. And the ultimate price we pay, of course, by death. Drugs kill. In last 15 years, which you have seen that drug overdose deaths have nearly tripled. And if you look at in last two years or so, 2014 and 15, out of those drug deaths, somewhere in excess of 47 to 52,000, more than 60% of deaths, those drug overdose deaths, are because of opioid-related cause. It is important, and you, why it's important? Because these are preventable deaths. These are premature deaths. These people don't have to die. And that's where we come into the picture. What can we do as an individual, as a society, wherever you are, to make an impact right here, starting from individual person? Locally, so it's not like in, not in my backyard. I like to show some of the local slides to give the perspective that it is happening in our own community. Uh, if I take, if, if, if I, I would have shown you 2010 in the extreme left corner, we had like a numbers people dying of opioid deaths in single digits. Now you see 2016, 135. These are absolute number. You see from 14 to 15, we have more than doubled. Something very humbling. When we compare in public health data, which is our non-clinical vital science, I was used to clinical science and clinical vital science, like a blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, and all, which clinicians do. In public health, we are number people, right? But the numbers is the one which is guiding us what we want to do and comparative numbers are important. 
So if you look at the red, red bars, which are New York State, excluding New York City, because New York City is a little bit unique, uh, and the blue bar is Onondaga County, we are higher. Our rates, these are not absolute number, our rates are higher than the New York State excluding New York City. When you took the context of US, considering 33,000 opioid-related death, and you calculate based on the population, it's 16 per 100,000 as compared to we are 15 per 100,000. We are very close to the national average. We don't want to be winner, we want to be loser there. So this is something we really, this is the game which we really want to make sure that we don't go up there, we want to go down trending. Age group, it's important when we think of intervention, how do we target things? So from age, if you can see, this is our own local data from Medical Examiner's Office, is our, they spend from age 20 to 60, right, from here. So you're looking, and the most important is here 30 to 40 years of age group, which a lot of time clinicians see. These are people who are functioning, high functioning, they are addicted to opioids, and you don't know. You're seeing that like a portrait. You're not seeing the landscape of what is happening in their life. And it is very important to remember when we are taking care of patients. Ge geography. Uh, you have heard a lot, probably if you look into the rest of the United States, uh, especially when you're locking coal mining industries like West Virginia and all, uh, poverty has contributed significantly to the opioid epidemic because these are very hardworking uh, men and women and working in mines, having a lot of pain. They go to the doctors, they're getting opioid prescription. They jo lost job. A lot of mental health issues are happening because they can't fend for their family. Uh, you get the point, essentially, is that it leads to addiction and, and downturn. In our community, it's kind of a little bit complex thing because we don't have that kind of high mining industry and all those. We do have rural area, but not that square mileage as some of the other counties do. So our things is mostly in urban, which is on the left side, and suburb. And if you look at it, urban, when we look at the actually zip codes, we couldn't pinpoint whether the high census tracts or high zip code can we relate where the people uh, are dying because of opioid epidemic? We kind of got a mixed picture because some zip codes have high, some zip codes have low, while suburb has pretty high also. So we have sort of a mixed picture. We, again, poverty, of course, is a, one of those factors which contribute to it, contributes to it. But at the same time, opioid addiction leading to loss of employment, family structure, and all those things can result in poverty. So it's like a both sides, right? So we have to kind of be really cognizant of that. Um, uh, the, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Hochul has talked about, we have, we are the third highest in uh, having the babies who are exposed to the opioid because they're, when the women consume any opioid, whether it's a prescription or not, or illicit drug, their babies are going to be showing signs of withdrawal when they are born. And the way they are codified, it's called newborn drug-related diagnosis. As you can see, the bottom graph is New York State, excluding New York City, and we are up there blue, not to be proud of. And again, this highlights how big is the problem in our community. So. Um, we got the data. We always say we have the data. We are going to go. We diagnose the problem. We are going to go treat it. Wrong. It doesn't work that way. You have to sit in front of a patient, right, in a clinical setting. When I took care of a patient, both in East Coast, I worked here, then I moved to uh, California. Um, UCLA, as a hospitalist, I worked there as a faculty. You have to talk to a patient. We cannot talk to the whole community. Well, but we can. How do we do it? By doing community engagement. And how do we do that? By doing, in a way, surveys or focus group. These are the two places how we go. So that we need to see, do they feel, do, uh, do they perceive the same problem as we are saying from the data? Because we can come out and create all sorts of fancy program. If they feel like, really, that's not the problem which we think in our community, they are not going to get into that. And they are not going to be an active partner, as you have heard repeatedly, is to have a solution, we have to have engagement. And it's the same when you are doing clinical medicine. Your patient, when you're treating them, whether it's a diabetes, high blood pressure, unless you get their attention, they feel that there are consequences of that or there is something they can actually have better life, they are going to be not that compliant. It's no, it's, it's no brainer that we apply the same philosophy here when we deal with the community. 
So community engagement, we asked the four big questions. It's a big survey. It's on a website. You feel free to, uh, to surf our website. That's something I seem like a techie person here. But the point is there is a lot of information. I have a short time, so I'm going to kind of fast through it. We asked four questions. One is, what do you think are the biggest problem in our community? And look at that. They said 87% people said addiction to alcohol and drugs. And we got almost 3,000 people responded to our survey. That was a big one for, and we got good distribution from city of Syracuse as well as county. We were very proud of in, in doing that. And plus we did focus groups, so this is a combo. The second question we asked, what health behavior do you think uh, is a problem? Drug abuse and violence, and there are some other ones too. We kind of, I wanted to highlight some of the most important things which are pertinent to this talk. What we ask, what do you think our health system has issues? Do you have any things, concerns? Access to mental health issues. That's what Councillor Hudson said, right? High cost of health care, high cost of prescription medication. This is important. And also, to provide a community, I like to highlight, I was one of them, I still think I am, is 37% of people uh, uh, said that when we are leaving a healthcare facility, we kind of don't get it what our provider said it to us, so they don't follow the instruction, they can't, because we are not going into the, the way we call the concept of uh, health literacy or trying to understand how would it make sense. So if they are not following that, they're going to be back to square one. And the most, one of the other thing is, what is a healthy community? It's no brainer, health economy, healthy economy and job, good schools and all, right? So now we combine those two. We got data, we got community engagement, and we try to put things together. But before that, I would like to pinpoint a cu couple of concepts which a lot of you might know, but I would kind of say that I think it's, it's important when we are trying to work as a community. Everything starts from us, right here in the middle, right? As Helen has mentioned, that we are born the way we are in our zip code, our families and all, but over the lifespan, how our health gets affected. There are so many other things which are out of our control, can impact, so the individual behavior, social and family structure, living and working condition in which the healthcare services, like upstate, is very important part of that. But education, employment, and all those things are very important. And then the outer circle is, Lieutenant Governor was here, is the policy, what kind of governance, what county we live in, what state we live in, it matters. What government we have, it matters because the funds and policy change our life, exactly. So that's one concept. The second concept is when we take that and put that in how, how is the health of our community. Our health of a community is always defined by what are the health outcomes, right? I think all medical people know uh, mor morbidity and mortality. These are two things which we know that how we look health of the community is and how health of the community gets affected again by the health factor. And taking all those circles and putting them, because each and every circle has some fraction, which is devoted to that. And I kind of felt bad, first of all, and I saw that really almost 20 years of my life I spent, which impact 20% of the health outcome, right? So just feel like, wow. Uh, because you have to think. Because, no, but this is very important, 20% there. What I was not sure at that time as a clinician is, when the patient walks out of my office, when patient comes out, or, or out of the ward, is I have no control out there. I don't know much about that community. And I cannot find all those cushions which are right here, which can affect like a health behavior, social economic factors, and physical environment, which are 80%. They are part of the public health system, are there to work with me. But I was not aware of that. And that's what I, whenever I do this kind of presentation, I make sure that at least my clinical uh, friends will remember that there are people out there to help. There is a lot of cushions. We are not alone in this. And focusing on taking those two concepts and putting them, putting them in opioid, crisis, uh, opioid epidemic, we want to address the crisis. We want to uh, take care of, make sure everybody is getting treatment and also affecting prevention. In health department, we kind of come up with sort of a triad approach is to address the crisis. There is a medical crisis, there is a law enforcement. We have a lot of drugs flowing around in, in the community, so we want to be a partnering with the law enforcement, making sure that if somebody we need to report, we should. People are dying, medical intervention, Narcan, saves life. I actually carry my little thing here. 
You know, I got a little training thing here. This is something it's important. And as a physician, some of my conversation with my provider colleagues, sometimes they feel uncomfortable prescribing or telling a patient if they are in narcotic to have an Narcan spray. It's important to have that concept. Uh, treatment, Dr. Johnson has talked about that, so I'm not going to go. You cannot put anybody in treatment unless you save them, and that is important. And you cannot break this cycle unless you prevent relapse, you prevent the crisis, and you prevent new addicts. It's important. And it requires multiple organizations to work together. I don't have much time, so I'm not going to go there. That's what we are trying to do in uh, a drug task force, which I co-chair with the district attorney's office. We have multiple partners, which are partner agencies. They're all not listed here, but all three hospitals of this area are partner there, including community groups, including educational institu institutions, schools. They are all part of that, and we focus on prevention, crisis treatment, all these three areas, and they are tasked. We are pretty strategically aligned that way. What we are trying to do at this point is working in a, um, I think I lost one, maybe, oh, here. So what we are trying to do is, <coughs> in this task force, we are trying to do subcommittees, which, which everyone, so we have a goal, all three, three goals, we are talking prevention, crisis, and uh, treatment. All these subcommittees will take their own ish, their own task and will report, have their strategies, their deliverables, their deadlines. And that's what, it's a pretty active partnership. So I work with the medical provider subcommittee with the co-chair, uh, and that's, Dr. Johnson is a member of that, and is a task force, as well as uh, Councillor Hudson is, and many, some of you are here also. And if somebody wants to participate, most welcome to do. I see Gail is here too, so that is something we, we are very far from the poison center. The point is, we are part of the whole public health system, we got to work together. We, if we really want to change anything, we cannot do it. We can do certain things in our own, uh, personally, uh, family, or organizationally. So we all have a role to play because this is a societal problem. We have to really act together. And that's what, thank you. Let's take a moment just to thank our lovely panelists again because that was really informative and it's critical. So now I'd be happy um, to walk around with this microphone and if anyone has any questions, we can go ahead and answer them. So you are first, I think. Uh, Focus Greater Syracuse has learned that the older adults rely more on their pharmacists to tell them about their medications than they do their doctors. They don't hear it when the doctor tells them about what they're taking, but they do go to their pharmacist. So what is the role of the pharmacist in this? Okay, so uh, pharmacists are fabulous. I get calls from them uh, several times a week, and it's usually a warning that the patient is getting multiple prescriptions or something else that involves their health. So my experience is pharmacists are great, and they're, as Dr. Gupta said so nicely, they're just part of the community that is trying to prevent accidental death. What I would add to that is also is that pharmacists are, when I practice at that time, usually a lot of times they will call you if they are seeing certain thing in an individual. So they are pretty much a very active partner when they are doing case management. Uh, as long as, uh, sometimes I think they can do more for the pharmacist role because we, in our actually physician subcommittee, in a provider subcommittee, we have involvement of some of the, uh, not only insur also insurance company, as well as pharmaceutical company, where we are asking them is what else can you do to try to educate the um, individual that, you know, this may not be that good and maybe you should talk to the doctor or try to come up with some other thing. The other thing pharmacists actually, and pharmacies can play a role, which they are playing, is taking back the prescription. In our community, we, don't, we do have those take back prescription days. Uh, we have the police, uh, uh, actually some of the police stations, uh, they, they have those drug take back boxes along with the needle disposals one but the pharmacy actually can play a significant role in taking back unused medication because those are the one which become a, 
uh, attractive thing for, especially for the young ones, if they're seeing grandma had like a 60 pills of hydrocodone is sitting somewhere and she didn't return um, to that, so pharmacist can actually make it play a significant role. Hey, if you have unused medication, bring it back or dispose it right. So there is, everybody has a role. Uh, thank you. I agree that um, this is a very informative panel, especially because we've heard from three different perspectives, all of whom are part of both the way in which we can treat the problems and also the way in which we could try to prevent them. Um, I have questions in two areas. One, first of all, dealing with Dr. Johnson's dream um, and the opportunities that have uh, that exist here in Onondaga County that maybe Dr. Um, Gupta and Ms. Hudson can also address, and that is, uh, as part of that, having a access to a facility is very important, but will that also include mobile units where we can go out into the community and find where people are actually using? <laughs> and second of all, what would you actually think about what's being done, has been done in Vancouver for a while, what just started in Seattle, and what Ithaca is now thinking called the Ithaca Plan, including a supervised injection facility? The second thing, the second area is about the language we use. And this is something that all of us can work on, I think, myself included. Um, as someone who's worked in communication most of my adult life, I realize that the language used is very important in how we deal with issues, and especially in the area of health. So we're using the language like addiction and addicted, and we use abuser. And we find that that actually contributes to the stigma that we have about people who are heavy, heavily users of drugs. And that stigma, as we all know, leads to fear and shame and hopelessness and division and eventually even possibly death. So how can we also, all of us, learn how to use the appropriate language so we don't stigmatize people who are abusers or users of drugs and so that we can help them and help our whole community reduce the stigma that they might be able to access more help? Thank you. All right, so those are the most fabulous set of comments. So on my service, the medical students <coughs> say this patient has been abusing opioids for X years. They are immediately instructed what you just said. We don't have any abusers on our service. If someone's using drugs, that's already saying that they're in trouble. In terms of uh, what the intervention center would look like and what sort of serv services it would provide, it depends on funding. So you have to be able to charge for your services. If we're doing detox, if we're doing psychotherapy, we can bill for that to have injection drug sites or mobile vans, which would be great. We would have to have people who funded that. I'm on that committee that Candace Hatton mentioned for the Medical Society, the Public Health Committee that I'll be going to uh, in April is going to consider injection drug sites and we're going to strongly back them. And finally, instead of mobile vans, something that wouldn't cost any money, and I had an intervention center in Cambridge when I was at the Cambridge Health Alliance, the police would bring people from Harvard Square, typically, who were out of control with usually alcohol, right to us. So if someone had an accidental overdose and we're open 24-7, I would anticipate the police and ambulances would be constantly bringing patients in. Okay, everyone. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. Um, but I'd like to thank you all. I know this is important, and hopefully the panelists will be available if you want to ask any more questions throughout the day. Okay. Thank you.